using not in your vocabulary? Are you willing to outwork everyone in your next contest but need the right guidance? Drop those bad contest prep strategies and let New York Muscle Radio guide you on your journey to the stage. Whether it's your first show or you're going for that pro card, get a leg up on the competition with individual customized contest prep strategies. Visit NewYorkMuscleRadio.com and click on that coaching tab to get started. New York's very own muscle building coaches, Anthony Bevilacqua and Pete Kacharian, proudly present to you New York Muscle Radio. What's up, guys? New York Muscle Radio, episode number 108. How long should you diet for? What is the optimal amount of diet duration? It's your host, Anthony Bavalacqua, alongside my co-host, Big Pikachu. And if it's your first time listening to New York Muscle Radio, this is the only podcast on iTunes that gives you full-on information without all that fluff. But what's up, big guy? How's that? Uh, how's everything going? How's that hair fluff? Speaking of fluff, that fluffy hair. Well, got to be glued has not gotten back to us yet, so uh, I think I'm. Uh, we're gonna work on um, Gorilla Glue. Gorilla Glue. Big yeah, hair. that that would be my next my next sponsor if uh, if got to be doesn't uh, doesn't come on board. That can't be good, man. Gorilla Glue in your hair. Yeah, I think that'll work, man. You don't know Gorilla Glue? I know what Gorilla Glue is. You can't put that shit in your fucking hair. Are you just making a corny joke? <laughs> no, nah, anybody anybody who's listening to this, I'm sure somebody out of them know who's knows what I'm talking about with Gorilla Glue. What are you talking about? You take you actually put Gorilla Glue in your hair? No, nah, there's a there's a there's a type of gel called Gorilla Glue. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, so uh, we're going to work on Gorilla Glue. It's kind of like the knockoff version of Yeah, that's uh, a dumb name. Why would you make that for a hair gel when there's like you said Gorilla Glue, I'm like, automatically I'm thinking of the glue. Let me let me Google it really quick. It's definitely swear, not called Gorilla I Glue. I swear there's a hair gel called Gorilla Glue. It's definitely not called Gorilla Glue. Unless it's like a bootleg brand that I like that the 99 cent store sells. The Dollar Let's Tree. Let's see. Well, yeah, that's that's where I get it usually. The Dollar if I, Tree? If they don't have if they don't have uh Yeah, so it's like a knockoff. It definitely is it a might, knockoff. Yeah, it's a, it's a knockoff. It's actually called Gorilla Snot. Oh, even worse. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. It's called Gorilla Snot. Oh, not All right. So I was right. Gorilla snot. That's a so, horrible so name So, guys, for if a you show. can't get got to be glued, get some gorilla snot. Well, sometimes these companies, man, where the fuck they come up with a name like that? How, I don't know. Who man. thought of that? Like, who in the marketing department said, this is a really good name for a product? Let's call it gorilla snot and let's put it in your hair. Yeah, I don't know, man. And there's, there's, three, <laughs> different, there's three different types, too. <laughs> I don't know. What's going on, man? How's lifting? How's life? Life is good. Lifting, lifting could be better. It's not bad, I'd say. Uh, I was actually just telling you the other day how I, I slightly tweaked my back on on deadlifts, but um, rested up for two days and it just it feels like ninety nine percent better already, which is good. Uh, for anybody want to learn from my experience, if you're using a shitty bar with no grip on it, just put straps on. You know, because I I actually had a little incident. I was I was deadlifting and I I was pulling four oh five and I. I was pulling it pretty quickly up to my knees, and right when I got around to knee level, the bar started slipping out of my hands, and I think what happened was since it started to slip down, uh, the, the bar pulled me forward again a little bit, and when I went to kind of pull it back from there, it kind of jerked it back a little bit, and I tweaked something in my lower, my lower left side on my lumbar, and you know, me being me, I decided to do three more sets after that, and they felt like a 1,000 pounds, and I couldn't walk kind of afterwards for a little while i said all right i'm, I'm gonna stop after the deadlifts I was, I was planning on doing a lot more after that but i stopped and went home next day i was having trouble walking i said you know i'm just gonna stay at home for two days I stayed at home for two days and i i squatted yesterday i was pretty good so not bad it's how funny. about you I know, I know you have pain a little bit too going on well i wanted to talk about deadlifts quick but it's funny yeah. because you're the one who actually got me i got rid of my straps deadlifting and i actually find that to be better to do deadlifts strapless because um for me personally the way i set it up the way right before I lift it, I get um, I, I usually set my feet first and then I grab my hands on the bar. But when I do that, I, my hamstrings are loaded. So if mm-hmm. I had a, a loaded with the weight, so if I had to like hook on straps, yes, it I might agree. have taken yep. tension off my legs. So for me, I just got rid of the straps and I actually feel pretty good doing that. So it, it's not called using straps. I, I would say use chalk, man. Yeah, or chalk. I mean, you just what you need, need to not do is don't use a shitty bar to begin with. Um, but if you do use, make sure your grip is good because yeah, if the bar starts to slide out of you, it could cause all, all types of problems. But I do agree a hundred percent because when I started 
training without the straps, I noticed how much better my form was. And I went back to using straps a couple of times. And that was the, the main problem I had was it was very hard for me to load my hamstrings. And you would basically get that. that um, Stretch reflex. Yeah. you get Well, you get like the slack, you know, when you yeah, go to yeah, pull. Yeah. And it's almost like you're, you know, you go to pull on something and the slack then all of a sudden comes out and it's like a jerking movement. So it's it's very, it's not an efficient move when that slack comes out of the hamstrings. You want to keep that nice and tight. Yeah. You can even pick up, um, if you don't have access to regular chalk, you can get like those little bottles of liquid chalk. Yeah. And for an occasion like that, that's actually pretty good. You just squirt a little bit on your hands and you're good to go. And if you guys head on over to the show notes, I'll, I'll link up to which chalk that I use for both the lifting chalk and the liquid chalk. It's just a good way to uh, stick your hands in the bar and hold on. Yep. You guys want to grip it good. Don't don't uh, <laughs> don't have that bar sliding out. Wasn't I mean, that a commercial? The- grip it. Grip it good. Well, wasn't that a commercial for it something? It was something. Yeah, I don't it know. Was I, something. I, I don't that, remember that, what that was. That phrase came to my head from somewhere. I have a lot of things in my head that float around that just kind of come <laughs> out of nowhere. And I, I forget where it came from, but I know it came from somewhere. I heard it somewhere. Grip it, Grip it good. That was a yeah. commercial. That was like a 90s commercial. Yeah, it was something way back. Yeah, it was definitely a 90s commercial. Well, you asked me about my injury, so I'll, I'll go back yeah. to that. Um, I don't know what I have. I think it's my external oblique on my posterior side, so it's in my back. Um what ha- it's so like it's so tight from when i twist to the sides it feels so tight um i have a couple of things of what i think it is it's either an external oblique strain um it may be something with my si joint it may be a mix of both i really don't know but basically what happens is it gets really tight and then if i get in a certain position it's odd because sometimes i can get in the position and it won't hurt but i can get in a position and it causes that external oblique to cramp but it, I don't feel it in the front. It's like all posterior. So it's so weird. It's such a, I always get all these weird ailments. Like I never get like an injury that it's like yeah. common. Right. Because then right. it's easy to fix because it's common. I always get the fucking weird things. But I think that what happened with this, how I got this was going into sumo, switching from conventional sumo because my hips aren't that flexible. So when I switched to sumo, I wasn't ready. I built my sumo up impressively. I, I got up to 575. You know, within a year of doing sumo deadlifts, less than a year actually. When did I start doing sumo? When was that? A little less than a year, less I'd say. Year. It was right when we were um, training for the meet last October. You had yeah, switched so over way to less it. than a year. And um, mm-hmm. I went from I my old conventional max was like 550 or something like that. So I went to 575 doing sumo. But the problem was I don't think my hips were ready for that and had a lot of weakness and tightness in my hips, and that's what ended up causing this issue. And Every time I I kind of squat heavy, I feel it. It doesn't hurt, but but then it like it bothers me. It's more of a nag than anything else. Like I don't have any like pain. It's just a constant tightness in that external oblique on the right side. I don't know what it is. I gotta really go to the doctor and check it out. But again, we covered this in the last podcast. I hate doctors, and I I can't find a good doctor that I can go to that I can explain this to and and get a, the right answer instead of, oh, you know, take time off and take anti-inflammatory because that's not the right answer. I hate that answer. And it's such a generic answer. I've went to the doctor for injuries before and that was what I've gotten. Again, guys, don't listen to what I'm saying as far as like, if you have an injury, go to the doctor, go get it checked out. Don't take my word for it. I have a lot of experience in physical therapy, so I've tried a lot to rehab it and it has gotten a lot better. And I think it's on its way back to being hundred percent, but, uh, I just got to keep riding it out and I think I keep aggravating it. So that's why it keeps coming back. Yeah, I mean that's the biggest thing when you're an athlete, you know, whatever sport you're in, if it's if, even if it's not weight training or anything, you're going to be performing the same movements over and over again. And a lot of times these movements are what's aggravating it. So even if you do everything you can to, you know, relieve the pain, you're always going to have to go back to these movements, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, if it's if it's a constant movement issue, then you really need to address exactly what it is because a lot of times it's just overuse of the same movement over and over again. So, like you said, it was probably had something to do with the sumo. So, I think probably for you, are you you're doing just strictly conventional now? Yeah, I switched over to conventional. Yeah. I actually went from low bar to high bar. Mm-hmm. And um, I've been squatting high bar, but I recently switched back to low bar. Low bar bothers me a little bit because I think it puts me in that little bit of that sumo yeah. position mm-hmm. um, at the bottom. But I can squat so much more low bar. So for the I'm doing a meet this weekend and I'm gonna squat low bar for that meet, but I think I'm gonna go back to high bar just to until I get better. Yeah. But high props, bar fucking sucks, man. I was gonna say props to anybody who squats high bar heavy. You yeah, know what I mean? They fucking that was suck. that was one of the honestly and I, I I discovered, you know, the benefits of low bar for myself in two thousand 
I want to say it was around 2011, 2000. I was, I w- was training for a bodybuilding competition and I was religiously squatting high, high bar. And believe, th- to be totally honest, I think that I built my legs all from a high bar because yeah, you're my gonna, quads, because you're going to use more quads when you yeah, do my high quads, bar. my quads probably looked the best they ever did when I was, um, when I was squatting high bar religiously. But eventually I started getting a lot of pain in my lower back from the amount of torque, just play, the, the bar on the top of my back placing down because I have a very long torso too um, and I, I just one day I said you know what let me try doing low bar and I couldn't believe how much more comfortable it was for me to squat all oh the way my down God, it's so much and more comfortable I'm not very flexible at all so honestly I think <laughs> even, t- even today uh, my flexibility is terrible like it is v- it's very bad um, if I were to try to squat to depth with a high bar I probably would have trouble even making depth with high bar really I didn't know you were that inflexible I knew you were not flexible but oh, I didn't know it was man. that bad yeah it's I think it's just progressively getting worse. To be honest with you, the other day I was squatting, I was squatting. I was warming up. I do one plate, two plate, three plate, right? And I, for whatever reason, my knee sleeves help dramatically with me being flexible in and out of the hole. I don't know what I'm doing differently when I have my knee sleeves on, but I would squat one plate, everything would feel tight. I put two plates on, everything feels tight. Put the knee sleeves on, go to three plates, everything feels nice. I don't know. You're odd. I, I yeah I am but you know it's a lot of that has to do with tightness too I I generally have a lot of uh, tightness in my IT bands as well but you know when I put those sleeves on everything just feels good so but that's that's a very band aid solution to the problem yeah because yeah, like I, I said it I was just gonna say that if I if I'm squatting one plate and one plate doesn't feel comfortable for me it, it never does. You know, but when I start going heavier, I put the belt on, I put the knee sleeves on, everything feels good. But that's not what you should be doing because you don't want to squat one plate in pain, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I think that that brings me back to my original point here is that, you know, sometimes you, you kind of mask things. You know, you, you do things to kind of figure out a solution for it, but you never really get to the root of the problem, which, which I'm trying to do now. And I've been incorporating um, stretching, like real stretching, like a, almost like a yoga type of a stretching uh, at least once a week for right now, and I think it's helped dramatically with overall my flexibility and and just being better because I know that's one thing that I could always be better at. And I know it's 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 actually funny because it's bad to be too hypermobile, right. but if you're not flexible, it's worse. And I know I have chronically tight hamstrings, so it's mm-hmm. something that I got to stay on top of and keep stretching. And I think that all this plays into part. So hopefully, when I recover from this injury, I'm gonna be way better than when I started. And I eventually want to go back to sumo, but I got to work my way back up and I want to do it correctly and make sure that all the tight muscles in my hip are not tight anymore and they can accept the range of motion that I'm going to put them through. So that's a little gist there on uh, (laughs) injuries. It sucks to be hurt, but it's part of the game. You know, when you're pushing yourself at levels all the time, you know, something's bound to not hold up. Yeah, you're going to have to deal with all the little the little things that come along with it when you train the way you do too. You know, if you're talking about somebody who's a bodybuilder and they just they squat once a week on Fridays, every Friday they just they just squat. <laughs> uh, you know, you you're probably not going to have to deal with, you know, working your 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 mobility as much, you know, making sure that you're, you know, you're taking care of foam rolling and everything like that and injury prevention. But when you're squatting 3 times a week, deadlifting 2 3 times on top of that, yeah, you're going to have to make sure you pay attention to all those little things. So it's not really going to come wanna, without a price, that's I for sure. I really want to do the squat every day program. I really want to do it, but I have to wait till my low bar gets back to normal. I have to. But I really want to try it. I really want it to be my next routine that I try. So hopefully I'll be able to give that a whirl. But let's move on, man. The listener question of the day. So, again, if you guys have a question you'd like us to answer, you could submit it on our website, newyorkmuscleradio.com slash listener question. All right, today's question. Hello, Pete and Anthony. First off, I, I want to sincerely thank you guys for the shout-out. You guys have changed my life with your podcast, and I cannot be more grateful. That was nice. We changed his life, man. That's always great to hear. You know, Once I mean, it, it, oh. it, some, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna no, no, no. Question. I'm saying it, it's, ni- it's nice to know that you know, people listen to it and apply it. We talked about this in the last podcast because when people say, oh, this podcast changed my life, it's really – Okay, we tell you, you know, what, what, what you could be doing to help you, and then you, you go apply it, and it'll change your life. You know what I mean? It's not like we put this out there, and I listened to this, now all this great stuff happened. You know what I mean? You made it happen. So Yeah, you have to take action. We talked about right. that in the Lads podcast. Um, he said, one suggestion for a possible podcast topic, how to maximize testosterone naturally. I've heard of guys eating certain things like pomegranates to get the natural tea up. Just wondering your thoughts on this. 
I think that's a great podcast, and now I will make that the next podcast. So podcast number 109 will be how to maximize testosterone naturally. I think that's a good topic. We never really talked about that, so I'm clicking my pen here. Yeah. I think that's and I it's think going that's for, on the pad. I think we're not, we're not going to get into it now, but that, this will lead us into it. You said we we not we don't really talk about that, and there's a specific reason. Yeah, we don't. that's enough, Pete. Yes, so already, already, <laughs> already jumping ahead. You're jumping at a whole podcast. Piece of crap. All right, he, continuing on with his question, I also have a question for you guys on front squats. So, what are your thoughts on front squats? Do you feel it's necessary to program front squats in to optimally grow your quads? Is there any advantage on to doing front squats over back squats. I listened to the Lane Norton episode on how he would front squat four or five for reps, and it got me thinking. I personally hate front squats, and I feel that it puts more stress on my core than my quads. And was wondering am I, if I'm missing out by focusing only on back squats. Thanks for everything, Mitch. That was a good question. So you listened to the Lane Norton one and um, talking about front squats. So do you have to do front squats? No. I do think that front squats actually play a big role in developing a good core so you're feeling it more in the core because your core is weak see the problem is when we when we do too much of one movement so we'll just use a low bar back squat for example you use a lot more it's a more of a hamstring posterior type of a movement you're going to load those muscles constantly over a daily basis what starts to happen is you start to develop a little bit of an imbalance in the quads you know your quads are still working so it's kind of hard tough to say but like for me for example i i switched from low bar to high bar so when you shift to a high bar you shift the bar in a different position and you use more of your quads so when i switched over to to from um, high bar squats i was using more quads the weight was dropped dramatically and um i actually built up more quad strength now when i switched back to low bar squat i noticed that the low bar back squat felt stronger and i think that's because my quads had to get stronger doing more high bar squats so i think that every movement has a play in your routine and i think it's important to not focus just on one exercise and you should always be a period of switching through you know exercises the reason why you feel more stress on your core than your quads when you do front squats is because your core is probably dramatically behind your quads as far as strength goes so if I were you, I would put front squats in as an accessory movement to back squats. I would probably do them right after that, and that should help fix that up. Once you start feeling it less in the core and more in the quads, that means that your core kind of caught up to you. I think I ranted yeah. a little bit there, but I think I answered this question. Yeah, that that definitely that definitely answered it. And the only thing to add to that really is, you know, you have to you don't have to do any one particular exercise for anything. If you have a specific goal and you need to work around that goal, front squats might play into that. You know, like Lane as an example, the reason he was doing front squats is his quads were always, you know, a weak point for him and he wanted to bring those up for his competition. So he uh, he was very strong squatting, but his quads just really didn't match the amount of weight he could squat. So switching to a more quad dominant stance and position with a squat with a front squat, that helped him grow his quads. So for him, that would be great. For me, you know, I'll use myself as an example. My quads have always been over dominant of my hamstrings and glutes. So me actually doing front squats is not going to help me build the glutes and the hamstrings as much. So a low bar back squat is actually better for me. So it depends on your goals. You don't have to do anything. Yeah. If you don't want to fucking squat, you don't have to squat either. I mean, that's yeah, that's true. It's that's the true. Truth. If, you, if your legs are big and you're you just care about how your upper body looks, or maybe you're going to jump on our arm program that we're going to put out in a couple of weeks, you know, you don't have to fucking do legs. No, be, I mean, let's be realistic, man. Honestly, there's a lot of people who go to the gym that have great upper bodies that never fucking do legs. This question is like a little odd because no one ever asks about different types right. of squats. Everybody's always like, yeah, it is funny. You know, what's true. the best exercise you do for, for arm growth or this or the chest growth? No one ever says about fucking legs, you know. Yeah. But the but the truth is, you know, the in a two year period where my upper body made the most dramatic gains in a two year period, I did not train legs at all. I yeah, trained I, them maybe here and there when I wanted to, but I took two years off of training my lower body and I just did upper body. And you know what? It grew more in that two years than, than any other two year period. Yeah. I agree with you hundred percent there because I did the same thing. The only thing that I've noticed was now that I've added legs back in is I feel overall stronger. Like in every day. Yes, when I yes. wasn't doing legs, I didn't feel strong. No, I, I agree a hundred percent. It's like a weird feeling. Now that I do legs more, yeah, obviously I do them a lot. But when I do, when I started adding legs back in, I definitely felt a lot stronger in everyday use. Yeah, everyday because no matter what whatever. you do for the upper body, your your core, your lower back, all that stuff is not going to get the same same work done as it will doing something even even as simple as just throwing squats in there. 
even if you don't do a whole leg workout, as long as you throw squats in there, you're going to be much stronger overall. So I do think squats are a very important exercise. But hey, you know, if you if you want to focus on something else, you don't have to do a certain thing. You don't have to do everything. Do whatever the fuck you want to do, like the Hodge twins say. It's true. I, I never understand why all the time everyone like, you know, like bodybuilding. Is it like I hate to say it, but a lot of them are just like sheep. You know what I mean? Like they'll, they'll just start making like the jokes on the legs and like, oh, you have to train legs, you have to squat. Like, no, you don't fucking have to. <laughs> you know what it's I mean? Truth. It's the truth. But people are gonna you know, start it's, talking it's shit same. about me now. Pete says yeah, you don't well, have to do legs. But. Everybody knows you're a piece of crap, man. So yeah. no one has to say anything about you. But it was the same thing for us when we first started dieting. And when we first started dieting, we we you have to eat brown rice. You have to eat. Sweet yeah, potatoes. yeah. You don't have to eat that stuff. It's just another calorie that you can eat. You can eat it. And yes, there's benefits that versus a pop tart, but you don't have to do that. Same right. Thing, same and thing with anything else. Yeah, exactly. And you know, for you know, everyone says, okay, if you want to build big quads, you have to squat. I definitely think overall, if your goal is to be the strongest and the best at whatever it is you're doing in bodybuilding, powerlifting, whatever, yeah, the squat is is a must do exercise. But if you want to build quads. Honestly, I wouldn't say that the squat is necessarily the best. I think it's one of the best. Believe it or not, I honestly think what, what put the most meat on my quads uh, was actually hack squats, believe it or not. I know yeah, that sounds like a little bit squats. bro, actually, do, but, but like if, you do, if you do hack squats correctly and you hit depth with them, they could be easily be more intense than, hack, than, than barbell squats because you could actually go to failure on a hack squat. I actually hurt my shoulder doing a hack squat. Yeah, I've hurt my back a couple times doing them too. But my, <laughs> my, my quads grew, grew pretty good when I was doing – I think I was doing like five plate hack squats all the way down. At the same time, I was only squatting like three plates on a barbell. Those and burn I was, though. Hack squats, yes, if you do them correctly, painful. they will kill. I'm telling you, I dreaded – I used to – when I was contest prepping my, in, a, in a show of 2011, hack squats were in my routine one day and barbell squats were in my routine one day. And you know when you're contest dieting, you're getting very lean – there's certain exercises you don't want to do. Like, oh, I really don't feel like squatting heavy just because you're lean. You don't feel strong. Every day I had to do hack squats, I dreaded it. And every day I went in, I had to do barbell squats. I'm like, all right, at least it's not hack squats. I'm all telling right. you, you can, make them, you can make them more intense. I'm not, just, I'm not just being dramatic. Yeah, he's being a little dramatic. All right, guys, we're going to take a short commercial break, and we'll be right back with how long should you diet for and what is the optimal diet length. What's up, guys? It's your host, Anthony Bevilacqua. Did you think I would let my co-host, Big Pete, make all the commercials? Welcome to the New York Muscle Radio Podcast. If you want to learn how to get bigger, stronger, and leaner while eating what you want, pick up your copy of Cracking the Flexible Dieting Code, now available in audiobook version, exclusively on NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. But for now, let's get back to the show. Hey guys, it's your host, Anthony Bevilacqua, and I just wanted to announce that my brand new personal training facility is now open. I'm currently taking on new clients in the Long Island, New York area. If you're interested in working with the best personal trainer in the business, head on over to abfitnesstrainer.com and sign up for your free consultation. Then you can understand why bodybuilding.com has named me Personal Trainer of the Month. What's up, New York Muscle Radio listeners? It's your co-host, Big P. Kacharian, and I'm glad you're all listening. Put down that tilapia and asparagus. Learn how to get bigger, stronger, and leaner eating what you want. Pick up a copy of Cracking the Flexible Diet Co. exclusively at NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. But for now, let's get to the show. All right, guys, we're back. New York Muscle Radio, episode number 108. What is the optimal diet length? So this is a good topic, and I'm excited to talk about this because it seems like the trends always shift back and forth. When I first started lifting, you know, it was common. 12 weeks was the common contest prep diet. That was how long it was. 12 weeks you dieted, you got on stage, that was it, end of diet, back to bulking. Now it seems like the trend is shifting the other direction. You know, I've heard obscene numbers, 40, 50, 60 weeks of diet and contest prep. I mean, that's insane, dude. Yeah. That's insane. So what is right? What is right? I don't know, man. I can't even well, fathom let, let's, dieting let's, that long. Yeah, let's start off with this. The right amount of time dieting is going to depend on how much fat you need to lose. That's that's first. I don't think you should take any longer or any less just because. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. think that the best way to answer it, we're going to get into a lot more detail, but the best way to answer it to start is the amount of time it will take you to get in shape. So if you have 20 pounds to lose you know, to get in contest shape, you shouldn't expect that it's going to take 
you know, that you're going to get there any faster than losing about two pounds a week. You know what I mean? So you shouldn't diet any shorter than 10 weeks, I'd say, if you have to lose 20 pounds. Maybe you get away with a little bit less, but it definitely wouldn't be optimal. Um, and at the same time, if you know, you're not going to need 40 weeks to get in shape. You can do it that long, but I wouldn't say, say, okay, let's do 50 or make it any longer than that. So, you know, you need to diet to lose anywhere between one and two pounds a week on average. You know, that's, that's what I think the optimal diet length is, but there's definitely circumstances where longer than that or shorter than that is actually going to be better. But in most cases, that's a very general rule of thumb. So, I mean, I've heard, of, we actually had on Jeff Alberts on this podcast and he mentioned that he does long contest right. preps. And we didn't actually get into, I guess it didn't cross my mind at the time, but um, he does long contest preps too. I don't know, man. I, yeah. I think, well, first of all, I agree well, how with how long how long was his I forget exactly how many 50 weeks, weeks he said. I think 50, it was like 50 weeks? weeks okay yeah okay so you know I agree with what you said you know you have to make sure that you're dieting you know the the amount of time you should diet should be only as much as you need it to be I don't think it should be any more than that I agree the problem is when you enter a contest prep for I mean at least for me mentally I'm logged into that you know like right. I, I I'm not the type of person to miss workouts I usually don't skip workouts I don't cheat on my diet I'm not like that at all but when you say contest prep and when you put yourself in a contest scenario your mindset just automatically shifts for me anyway at least yeah for me a hundred percent yeah so to th- even though literally if I was dieting 40 weeks for a contest prep and I was dieting just regularly and then did what did a 12 week diet you know the, the the intensity for both diets would probably be the same. But right. just mentally knowing that it's 40 weeks of contest prep would hold so much on me. I wouldn't be able to take it just from that point. Like talking about it now, I'm like, oh, I don't even want to do bodybuilding anymore. Why would I even want to do right. that? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. 40 so, weeks of dieting is a fucking long time. 40 so his, weeks. Yeah. His, his, his rationale behind doing that was he said, you know, okay, if I diet a lot longer, uh, I don't have to diet as hard. So so technically, technically, we're not talking about practical application. We're talking about, you know, statistically, he's going to diet unless – He's gonna he's gonna eat more food, so he's not gonna be in as big of a deficit. Okay, um, so technically that might be less stressful. I don't really believe that, but um, you know it, it might be less stressful because he's gonna be dieting on more calories, and yeah, he's I don't gonna believe pre- that either. He's like gonna I just said I don't believe that. Right, he preserves. He's gonna preserve more muscle mass because he's not gonna have to diet on as much calories. But there's two sides of the fence on that. Um, you could actually argue that both ways and, and we could get into that, but that's his rationale. Okay. So, um, and then he can even include diet breaks in there to get his metabolism back up. Again, there's two sides of the fence to that too. Um, but that would be the argument for longer diets. Okay. And that sounds great on paper. Okay. If I diet longer, then I don't have to diet as hard. Uh, I can take a diet break in there and I'll, I'll maintain more muscle because I don't have to diet on as as few calories because I'm not trying to diet so fast. That's one. That's that's the pros, I guess you could say, to longer diet, <clears throat> longer diets. Um, the cons. Now just, just took over the whole pod, Pete's podcast. Do, are we are we up to that yet, or am no, I going? No, you just ahead? totally skipped ahead. But I'll just go ahead. We'll start with that then. All right. So we'll start with that then. So, but are we missing anything before no, no, we get no, no, into no, this? No, the cons. Okay. So the cons to that. Now you could basically argue all those on the other end of the spectrum. So. If you're dieting, if you're dieting that long, number one, okay, you're gonna be in a deficit for a very long period of time. Even if you take diet breaks, you're gonna expose your body to burning body fat and being in a caloric deficit for a long period of time. A lot of negative things happen when you expose your body to a deficit for a long period of time, especially with the metabolism, especially with the mood. That's probably gonna be the biggest thing, to be honest with you, because I know myself when I'm in a deficit for a long period of time, your your mood just changes. You know what I mean? If you're always thinking about food, your stress levels are always going to be very high. Um, so you have to take that into consideration. I personally would rather be more stressed out for a short period of time than be a little bit stressed out for a long period of time. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I mean, going back to what I said, yeah. I'm cutting you off a little bit there, but yeah, going no, back no. to what I said too, um, you know, just the fact that you know that you have contest prep in the back of your mind, that's going to put, it doesn't matter if you die, you die could be literally the exact same day, but just knowing that you're 40 weeks into this contest is going to, burden on you and you know you want to be 100 percent perfect especially for me so for example if i had something coming up you know whatever it would be whatever um it's just gonna weigh on my mind like oh well i have to diet i have to go to the gym i have to do my cardio you know where if i wasn't in that quote-unquote contest prep mode i would still get it done but it wouldn't play play a stress on my life 
Yeah, I mean, and you know, we always talk about moderation, but the people that are best in anything they do, if they do, if whether it's bodybuilding, whether it's powerlifting, when they're committing to competing for a certain event, um, the people that do the best, they don't have days where they don't perform. You know what I mean? Okay, I take a day off or I slack today or whatever it is. So if your contest diet is going to be 40, 40 weeks long, that means you have to be ready to perform 40 weeks straight with no hiccups. And hiccups always come. You know what I mean? So that's that's one of the major drawbacks of that too. Um, you know, so what were the other three pros I said the other two pros I said so well, we talked about the length um, the cons I mean you know th- that sucks the length dieting yeah, that that time. and then the other thing too is you have to for as long as you diet usually typically is how long you should reverse for now I don't recommend reversing for 40 weeks I think that's absolutely yeah. crazy because you'll lose all this progress in that amount of time but that could also be that's a con of it too you, you're you're also missing out on periods of growth. And let's face it, all of us get into lifting to obviously look better. Obviously, you want to be leaner. But the main purpose is you want to build muscle. You want to look different. You you know, if you're a guy, you maybe you want bigger arms. For a lady, maybe you want a bigger butt, but whatever, bigger legs, you know, more toned legs. You have to build muscle in order to do that. If you're dieting for 40 weeks and then you're reversing out of that for, let's just say, 10 weeks, that's 50 weeks. How many weeks are right. there a year? 52? Yeah. That's almost a whole year you wasted on one contest. Where you literally made no progress. I mean, not, I shouldn't say no progress, but no progress enhancing your physique. Right, right, you right. You only got leaner. That's it. Which you could have done that in a shorter period of time. Right. Because once you start entering your dieting phase, let's face it, if you're a natural, you're not going to be putting on any muscle. You know what I mean? If you're in a deficit, even if you're in a very like a, a slight deficit for a long period of time, your body's not going to be building any muscle. We know, we already know how hard it is once you're past the advanced newbie stages, you're into the advanced stages to put on muscle, even if you're in a surplus. Um, so when you're, you know, for you're an advanced uh, bodybuilder and you're dieting that long, you're, you're taking away time that you're going to be putting on muscle. And, you know, um, this really seems to be the trend now. A lot of people are focusing on longer diets because they think it preserves more muscle. I've never really seen many people lose too much muscle during a contest prep where it would be necessary to stretch it to like 40 or 50 something weeks. I don't know, whatever it is. But, you know, somebody who's really been promoting the longer diets, I've seen this a lot on social media lately, is uh, Cliff Wilson. And I don't know if he was kind of the inspiration for Jeff Alberts to do this too. I could be wrong, but it seems like it's a new trend. And he's making a lot of arguments lately on, on social media about Longer diets are helping him preserve more muscle and he doesn't have to diet as hard. And I don't know how many weeks he's been dieting for. It seems like fucking like the last like two years, you know, and his argument is that he could lose weight very slow this way, but he's holding on to all his muscle. And while that definitely is true, if you diet much on higher calories, you're not going to lose as much muscle. But if you're taking all that time out of the year, just being in a dieting phase, you're never going to have time during the year to make improvements. If you're going to spend the whole year dieting, then you have to reverse diet. You're going to be spending all this extra time. You need to build some muscle at some point, you know. And I think people are getting caught up on conditioning in bodybuilding for for natural bodybuilders because obviously it's hard to build muscle, but it's a bodybuilding competition. It's not a conditioning. It's it's a bodybuilding competition. It's not a conditioning competition. So you have to eventually build muscle. I think people are forgetting about that, you know. And being that lean for that long. You're going to have to have a long period of time where your metabolism, your body are adjusting to higher body fat percentages afterwards. So you're not going to just transition once you start eating into building muscle again. You're going to have to take almost, I'd say at least half the time that you spent dieting, just getting back to normal levels, then adding muscle. So I think people are spending so much time dieting that it's, it's taking away from the overall picture. I think maybe uh, for his, I'm not, I mean, I'm not arguing with him and uh, I'm not arguing for him, but basically mm-hmm. what I, I could I think of what he would say if he was to rebuttal you on that would be, you know, and I can't speak for Cliff, so I'm not mm. speaking for him. But basically what I'm saying is that I think his response to be, well, genetically, I can't gain really any more muscle at this point in my career, which I agree with. But at the same time, for me personally, I didn't want, I didn't get into working out to be skinny, to look like right. I don't even lift in a shirt. Like to me, that's the right, worst right. part of contest oh, prep. You know? Yeah, you wouldn't want to do that for a whole year. No, no way, no way. I try and get that part over with as fast as possible. I, I want to. St- yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and that that's that's what happens when you get that lean. You will be very, very tiny and, and look very sick in a shirt. And I don't want to look like that. Um, you know, if you're a competitor, whatever, you got to do what you got to do. You're gonna have to go through that period where you don't like where you look in the t-shirt, whatever. Uh, but you know. 
I think people are spending way too much time focused on dieting. And, and you know, I know a couple, I cu- know a couple WMBF pro bodybuilders who they don't get too caught up in like the science behind everything. And I think that that's a, that's a great thing. I think a lot of people, you know, I know Cliff is very into the science. A lot of these guys, Jeff Alberts are very into the science and that's a great thing, but I think they get caught up into it too much where they're going to start spending 50 weeks dieting because the science shows maybe I'll preserve a little bit more muscle. But when practical application comes into play, you have to think about a lot of other things. If you're training for 50, 52 weeks in a caloric deficit, your intensity is going to go down. You know, you're not going to be training that hard. When you're done and you're going to go transition into a mass gaining phase, are you really going to want to be training heavy and pushing the weights and everything after you just put your body through all this for 52 weeks? I know I'm going to want to just sit around and relax afterwards. You know what I mean? Then you're going to be taking away from that too. I know a lot of guys that are at the top level who I know a couple, I know a couple WMBF pro bodybuilders who died for like six weeks before a show. You know, because they yeah, stay that's pretty, also genetics too. Yeah, that's definitely genetics. But if you think about it this way, even if it's an aggressive, let's say not even say six weeks, let's say 12 weeks. If it's an aggressive 12 weeks, okay, your body's going to transition in and out of that much quicker than if it was 52 weeks, even if it wasn't as aggressive. Because if you're applying a stress to your body for 12 weeks, you can recover from it a lot faster than a 52-week stress to the body, whether it's training, whether it's nutrition. You know what I mean? Yeah, so that... So this is leading into our next thing, which is the benefits of short-term duration diets. And like you said, you know, go ahead. You can continue on your rant, but I just wanted to point that out. This is the benefit yeah. of dieting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the major benefit. I've gone through 12-week contest preps in my early, my early contest. That was pretty much a standard, like you said. That's what, that's what everybody was doing. And I've dieted pretty aggressively for 12 weeks. I had to get my calories lower. Um, you know, I had to do more cardio. I had to suffer a lot more during those 12 weeks. It wasn't like a, you know, it was a prep. You know what I mean? Those 12 weeks I was in training. You know what I mean? I didn't feel good. You know, there was no part of prep that felt good and that was what was considered. But you know what? That's three months. You know, afterwards. I was just going to say that. It's like a blink on the scale. Yeah, three months is is nothing in a in a career for a bodybuilder. You know, I was I, I felt like shit for three months. Okay, you know how easy it was to get back into normal, feeling normal after that. The transition was pretty quick. Now I've had other preps where I've done sixteen and twenty week preps, and you know, arguably I did get in better shape, but I knew what I was doing more at that time in terms of getting leaner, and I pushed I pushed my body further than I did during the twelve weeks. But after the 16 or 20 weeks, my recovery period was, was so much longer before I felt normal again because I put my body in a, a deficit for 16 to 20 weeks. So the recover, your body just doesn't transition back into normal right away. A lot of people think, okay, I'll have a cheat day the next day after a contest and then I'll start eating on Monday and by you know, next week I'll feel good. My body didn't feel normal again for like four months afterwards. Pete's and that's still not recovering. Even exactly. He's still not normal. Huh? I said you're still not recovering. You're still not normal. Oh yeah, I know. I'm still still since uh since that contest, I'm still recovering. <laughs> well, th- I mean, I think then I'm gonna rebuttal you talking about the little, the cons of a short term diet. I mean, me personally, like I said, I'd rather go through a period of three months of hard and then be done with it, than going on with it for six, eight, nine months out of the year dieting. I I just can't even think about that. But um, the cons of short term dieting, um, like I said, you might not get lean enough. You know, 12 weeks might not be enough time to get you into shape. Um, and it's going to – obviously, you're going to be suffering a lot more on a short-term diet because you have to really bump up. You have to make sure you're losing every week. You can't – also, when you're dieting for short-term, you can't have any hiccups. You know, if you're giving yourself 12 weeks to diet, you cannot, you know, leave any – you can't slip up once. You can't have anything like that happen. You have to be on point from day one to the last day. You can't have one miss, and that's the bad thing. When you're doing a longer-type diet, you could – Allow those days, you know, you know, okay, I know I'm, I know I have a wedding here, so I know I can up my, up my calories here a little bit for that day and then, you know, fix it. But if you have a wedding coming up during that three months of the contest, well, you're going to be eating out of a Tupperware that day. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, that's why I don't necessarily think that shorter diets are, are better. Sorry, I lost my microphone for a second. I don't, got, I don't got necessarily. I'm so here talking about diet duration. <laughs> I don't really think that shorter diets are better, but I think the amount of fat you need to lose is going to dictate the length of the diet, and I don't think it needs to be longer. Um, so that plays a role in the off season too. So if you're if you're optimizing yourself in the off season, like right now where I am in the off season, I could get in shape in 12 weeks, and like it's no problem. I don't need a 16 or 20 week prep where I am right now. At other times, 
I definitely couldn't get as lean as I needed to in 12 weeks. So it's going to depend on where you are in the offseason and how you optimize that. I think the goal with the offseason is you should keep yourself in a position where if you can do a short diet, you should do it. You shouldn't, for- you shouldn't force yourself into a position where if I have to get in shape, it's going to take 20, 30, 40 weeks. Yeah. Again, I, I think that for really you have to be able to – if you're going to figure out you want to do a contest, you're going to figure out how many weeks you are. I think you should break that up into different blocks, and I think you should kind of go from there. You know you know that you're – if the contest is 40 weeks away, let's just for argument's sake, I think you should – the last 12 weeks should be the hardest weeks, and then leading up to that, you should definitely you know get yourself ready mentally for that contest prep. But I don't think you need to be in a deficit for that amount of time. That's that's insane. Even though, yes, you're going to be eating more during that time, I just I just – I don't know. For me, mentally, I wouldn't be able to handle that, so I will not ever be doing a 40-week contest prep. I mean, never say never, but I don't think I will ever be doing that. No. And like you said, hiccups are going to come along the way, too. And, you know, you're allowing a lot. You know, it, you can argue it both ways. You know, if it's 12 weeks, you have no room for hiccups. And, yeah, you have room for hiccups if you're doing a 30-week contest prep. But then you think, okay, a lot could go wrong in 30 weeks as opposed to 12 weeks. You know what I mean? A lot of different things could come up. Sometimes it's better just to commit a chunk of time to devoting everything 100% than to kind of put it in kind of mix it in with everything else you have going on. You know what I mean? One thing that I want to touch upon too is, you know, we're talking about contest prep and right. fuck contest prep because a lot of people who listen to this podcast, maybe they're not bodybuilders. Maybe they just want to get in better shape. You know, the, the mm. average person listening to this podcast um, – how long should you diet for? Well, you should set a goal. You know, if your goal is to lose 20 pounds, you should diet enough to lose that, but not in so long amount of time. So if you were to lose one pound a week, that would take you 20 weeks to get there. So you could do it a little more aggressively, but just understand that you're going to have to give up a little more to take a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, it pretty much applies to people on both ends. But, you know, for if you're not, if you're not contest dieting, then the good thing is you don't have a time requirement. You know, the contest is not on a certain day. If you don't make weight or if you don't look a certain look by that day, it's not the end of the world. So, you know, if you're getting closer to your contest and you're like you're six weeks out, but you still have more weight to lose than the six weeks is going to allow, you have to increase, you know, the aggressiveness of the diet. If you're just dieting just to look good, you don't have to pick it up. You just might have to extend it a little bit. So that's always a good thing, too. You have, you know, you have that option. Um, but you should put yourself in a position where, you know, you should diet, like I said, in, in a relative time frame to the amount of body fat you can lose because you don't want to extend your diet for a year if you get it done in four or five months. You know what I mean? Um, it just, again, the stress that comes with it is not necessary. You kind of want to just, I always tell people when they have a goal, whatever it is, you know, do what you need to do to accomplish it, get it done and then be done with it. Don't drag it on for any longer than it needs to be dragged along. Yeah, there's no point in that either. You know, I, I agree, you know, doing a, I mean, maybe mentally, I'm trying to think of how, you know, Cliff Wilson and Jeff Alberts, how mentally they handle that. Because I, I don't know, man, for me, and I'm not to say I'm mentally weak or anything, but I just, just having that dwell in my mind for 40 weeks, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. It's almost a whole year. Just dieting up to one show, that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it that way too, what the outcome is from it, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's, it's worth, worth it, it for yeah. what you what what you're getting out of it. And I think if you, I mean, I guess if they look at it, if their perspective on it is it's absolutely worth it to go through with it, then I guess you know it's better for them. Enjoy yourself. But yeah, you know, you know what I mean. So I don't think it's worth it. So it's for me to do it. It's just not going to work out for me, you know. And I, I don't think it. I don't think it's practical for most people, to be honest with you. I really yeah. don't. Yeah. Yep, I agree. And like I said, for the average person who's listening to this or into fitness, you know, maybe they just want to lose 20 pounds, you know, and you got to understand, you know, if you want to buckle down, you could do it in a shorter amount of time. If you want to take a little more time, it's going to take you 20 weeks, but you have to understand that coming right up from the, the gate, you know, and, and understanding what's, what's coming up in the next three months, you know, for me to accomplish this. So I think we covered everything pretty much to do with this, man. I don't think we missed anything. Uh, did we leave anything out as far as diet length goes? I don't think so. No. Um, you know, this is kind of like the, it's kind of like the whole reverse dieting debate, you know, where there's really there's pros and cons to both ends of the, of the spectrum. Um, but you got to think about what's actually going to work more in practical application versus Bella. what the what the science is going to show. But uh, you, 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 you weren't on mute. <laughs> you weren't on mute. Yeah. The do- I tried to mute the thing, but the dogs the going nuts. The mailman must be here. But uh, yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. We covered everything here, and uh, yeah, that's it for us. Go ahead, big guy. Your turn. 
All right, guys, Pete and Anthony, New York Muscle Radio, and we're out. Enjoy this episode of New York Muscle Radio? Make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave us a five-star review, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, New York Muscle Radio.